Okay, thank you for attending. Um, yeah, this is a session talking about containers on embedded systems. We are from Toradex. Uh, Toradex is a Swiss company. Uh, as you can hear from my accent, I'm not Swiss, I'm Italian. I try to hide my accent by waving my hands a lot when talking, but they told me it's not working. <laughs> and Stefanin said it's from the head office in Switzerland. So we can start with the introduction. Yeah, you can find my uh, Twitter uh, ID here. Uh, probably my, my name is so uncommon that it's not hard to find me also on LinkedIn uh, or other uh, websites. Uh, I work for Toradex since uh, uh, six years now. Um, and yeah, I've been working on devices since the end of the previous millennium, so this also gives away my old age. <laughs> but I have some experience. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, my name is Stefan Eichenberger, and I'm from Switzerland, so unfortunately I don't speak Italian. Um, I work for Toratex now for exactly one year and one day, so um, <laughs> <laughs> I missed my jubileum. Um, and I'm working on devices since 2005, basically. I started with the 8051 processors back then. OK, so we in introduced ourselves. So now it's time for some questions for the audience, so we can also try to understand who's sitting in front of us. Uh, so how many software developers do we have? I was expecting them to be the Who is who's not, is not a software developer? Why are you here? <laughs> no, I know you. <laughs> How many embedded developers? So writing software for devices. OK, still a good share of the audience. And mobile developers, so developing mobile apps. OK, PC developers. OK, and don't, don't be shy. Don't be shy. I'm, I'm not going to kick anyone out of the room. <laughs> JavaScript developers? Out, sorry. <laughs> no, I'm joking. <laughs> How many? How many Linux users? OK, OK, quite a good number. And how many people already use Docker? Oh, here numbers are a bit lower. I hope that after the sessions, at least you will want to try uh, using this kind of technologies. Yeah, so um, as Walter already said, if you are not familiar with Docker, we want to give you a short introduction about containers in general. Um, then we want you to show you uh, how you can run containers on devices, like uh, embedded devices, not PCs, basically. Um, then we want to give you an overview how you could use uh, Qt from within the container. Then we try to give you a short demo. Of hopefully it will work. <laughs> That's always a little bit risky. And at the end, we do a question and answer session. So talking about containers, l let's start with the uh, easy one. Let's try to define what's a container in the real world. I think everyone knows them. The, they are those big metal boxes. And uh, basically, uh, the idea of containers started around the 40s and 50s, but they became widely popular in the 60s, uh, actually during the Vietnam War. Uh, when the U.S. has to move a lot of uh, stuff from mainland, mainland U.S. to Southeast Asia. Um, and basically, the key of success of the container, it's really not in the thing itself. I mean, it's just a metal box. Boxes have been around for centuries. Uh, but was uh, around the idea of standardizing the size and all the features of those boxes. That's really the key idea behind the container. It's not the, the thing itself, but it's the idea of standardizing this. And I started from the real world because I think that just for once in computer science, we took a real metaphor from, from, from the real world that really applies to what we are talking about. Other things like having a vertical desktop with the uh, trash can on top of it is not matching the real world. <laughs> but this thing, I think it does. And uh, if you move to the next slide, before containers, basically, uh, ports were a huge mess. If you live in a city close to the sea, like Genoa or something like this, basically the stuff worked like this. The, the ship was coming in the port, and people, people had to try to figure out how to unload stuff from the ship or to load stuff into the ship. And every ship was different. Everything was packed in a different way. This involved a lot of manual labor. 
and it was quite complicated and messy. And with containers, basically, the ships came in the port, and you have cranes, you have every, all the equipment you need to load those containers on trains, trucks, whatever. And since this stuff is heavily standardized, doesn't matter what the, what's inside the container. It's just a matter of taking it, moving to a different place. And that's really the, the idea and the key of the success of, of this real-world technology. And so we can move uh, talking about containers in software. Ah, sorry, no, I, I forgot one. <laughs> but uh, yeah, even with this standardization, uh, containers really can fit everything. Uh, we still have some things like cars or oil that are delivered by dedicated ships. So uh, even with standardization, you can probably cover like 70% of the market. You may not be able to cover 100% of it. But that's okay, because anyway, they simplified and make things easy for a lot of things. Not for everything, but for a good share of the things. And if you think right now, there are like 6,000 ships moving, uh, like 20 million of containers in this moment. So it's really, really big. So yeah, Walter gave you uh, an overview about real-world containers, but how is that related to software containers? Um, so you can think of containers as a lightweight virtual machine. Um, it's basically only a user mode virtualization, so uh, applications or virtual machines, or in this case containers, basically share the same container. Um, these containers are isolated between each other. Um, you may think, yeah, isolation, that, that's all something I already know, but um, here it also means uh, isolation of file systems. So each container has its own file system and has its own user space um, area. As for lightweight virtual machines or for virtual machines, it's really easy to port them so you can move one container to another system simply by exporting it and then importing it on another system. But in, in, uh, in what is different to lightweight virtual machines is that uh, it basically shares the same kernel, so it uses the native drivers of the Linux kernel. It's not like with VirtualBox or something like there. This where you have two kernels running at the same time. Another thing you can think of is um, it's also an easy way to package your application because if you think about um, an, a Qt application, you have a lot of dependencies to the Qt libraries and what you can do with containers, you can basically pack everything together and then you have a system that will boot up and run on a different um, device or on a different computer. Yes, that's basically the thing about software. Um, so uh, let's start with a short overview of, about containers in software. So uh, it's basically uh, containers in five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you are familiar of how a Linux OS looks like. So you basically your hardware. This means you have your CPU and your GPU on the bottom. Then you have the kernel, which abstracts basically the, the hardware and configures the hardware, uses the hardware, and gives a user space API to your application. The application normally is uh, located on a file system. It doesn't depend what file system. And then you have se several processes that all have their own virtual uh, memory. So one process cannot access the, process, uh, the, the memory of another uh, process if he doesn't want to. It, there are possibilities to break out, of course. But then you are doing hacking. But Basically, in this model, as we say, processes share a lot of things, the file system, the kernel. Uh, and so we have uh, kind of dependencies between the different processes. And this what leads to the, one of the mantra of software development, that it, it works on my PC. So it works on my PC because on my PC I have all the libraries, all the things in the right version, and so the software works. When I try to ship it to a customer, it stops working. So the first solution is actually shipping my PC to the customer. 
Okay. And this is basically the idea of virtual machines. With virtual machines, I build a virtual PC with everything I need, with the full operating system, with the kernel, and everything, and then I can ship my application inside it. As long as I have uh, the support, uh, so the hypervisor running under my kernel, so basically faking a physical machine for the kernel, uh, this is going to work on different devices. But of course, I'm going to ship a lot of things, and I'm going to run in multiple kernels on the same hardware. So this requires uh, quite a complex stack in terms of software, and also usually requires some form of hardware support for virtualization. And then we have containers. And containers are a sort of way in between. Uh, we still have the kernel on top of the real hardware, so we don't have the overhead of the virtualization. But now we have multiple processes, but on top of different file systems. This means if process zero, uh, sorry, start with this. If process one and process two can happily share a lot of libraries and they work with the same versions and whatever, I can keep them in the same container using just a single file system. But if process zero is a different thing, it's using different libraries, or maybe it's using a different version of the same libraries, or anyway, even if now it's using the same version of the same libraries, in the future that may not be true, but because it's developed by a different development team, it has a different release cycle, then I can isolate it in a different container and this as a copy of its own file system. The main advantage is that there is no virtualization here. It's user mode virtualization, but the kernel layer is still the same. So yeah, what are the advantages of, of containers then? Um, as Walter showed you, you can re easily split application and dependency in, in, uh, in their own containers. So let's think about a web server which has maybe um, a database in it and you want to run it um, on your system. Until now it was really complicated and you had to set up everything, you had to configure everything um, by your own, then you had a lot of wiki manuals and so on. Uh, nowadays, that's much easier because they can ship a container, everything is configured, the database is configured, the web server is configured, and, and you can simply start it. Further, it's easier to deploy. This is also more, or it, it's, it came, I mean, the whole container uh, stuff is basically a little bit coming from the server world. And there, if you have to deploy a lot of systems, it's really easy to, to deploy containers, but it's hard to deploy real um, operating systems between each of the server. The content does not matter, so you can put in whatever you want. You can put in configuration files, websites, uh, you can put in libraries, binaries, and so on. It's not important what it is. Another advantage, and I think that's also really important for embedded devices, is you can do resource management. So you can say this container only gets 50% of the CPU load, or you can say this, uh, this container can only use one, um, one processor. So basically it's done via C groups. You can do that for processes as well, but um, it's relatively easy to do that with containers. In comparison to uh, virt virtual machines, it has a much lower overhead. You only have the overhead of uh, a memory overhead, but you normally don't have any uh, overhead regarding processor speed. Uh, yeah, excited. You have also a lot of different uh, containers available today, like Debian, Ubuntu, Fedora, whatever you want. So it's it's, you, you can live within a, a known operating system if you once have a container set up. And to reduce the footprint, um, you can basically, you, or the, the especially Docker container has this uh, layering. So if you have a base system like Debian and you have your application on top of it, and then you have another com container that is also using Debian, you can use this mechanism of layering. So you have the base system only once, and on top of that, you have your um, once you, your application, and the other time maybe your web server. So since 
I think most of the audience is C++ developers. Basically, in containers, you have a sort of inheritance. So you can start from a base container, derive your own container with additional features, and the common layer is stored only once on the, on the device. Uh, but of course, I mean, nothing came for free, uh, apart from, from uh, software sometimes. <laughs> uh, so we also have some drawbacks. Uh, basically, we can identify some areas. Uh, the first one is that we need some more storage. As we already said, the system is optimized to try to minimize the uh, redundancy of, of the stuff that is stored on the system. But anyway, you need to store some things. And if you need different base distributions or anyway different components for the different containers, you will have some duplication. So at the end, the storage you are going to use on your device is going to be slightly more uh, than what you will have to do with the, let's say, monolithic implementation. Uh, same supply also to uh, memory, to RAM, because when you have like shared libraries, if you load the same library twice, the physical memory is just allocated once and then you remap the memory. Uh, if you load the same library in two different containers, for the system is two different files. So this is not happening, so you use a bit more memory. Uh, also, containers, as Stefan already said, is a sort of lightweight virtual machine. We can also see it as a sort of sandbox. So by default, I'm not able to access the hardware uh, from the container. Uh, as we are going to see in the demo, actually it's possible to do it. You have to explicitly enable it. This is some additional security. So I can prevent the container from accessing something I don't want it to access. But of course, every time we have security, uh, we have some extra overhead in terms of configuration and, and so on. Uh, and the last point is we have less isolation compared to virtual machine. In a virtual machine environment, if we, even if we manage to crash the kernel, we are going to crash a single virtual machine. Here, if we crash the kernel, we crash the whole system. But that's true also when you have the first model, the one with just single processes. So uh, in these terms, containers are not worse than regular processes, are probably not good enough as virtual machine, but as we say, they don't come with this kind of overhead. So now let's talk a bit more about containers on embedded devices. You should imagine this sentences uh, uh, with the voice of an old grumpy, old school embedded developers, a developer. So you can keep using my voice because I'm old. I am old school embedded developer. Uh, and basically, I, I started looking into containers like one year ago. I was in our office in Seattle. And uh, I was talking with Brandon, our colleague. Uh, at that time, Brandon was uh, working on innovation, so new project, new things. Now he's our CTO. And Brandon started talking to me, say, yeah, you know, you should start looking into this. I've been playing with this stuff a bit. And I think that running containers on devices is really a good idea. And I told him, Brandon, you know, we are supposed to have beer in the office only after 5 <laughs> p.m. And it's, it's still in the morning. I said, no, no, I'm not joking. Really look into this. And I said, oh, I mean, you know, containers are stuff for hipsters. You know, they use this stuff on servers. It's, it's really not going to work. But then Brandon is pretty good at convincing people. <laughs> so I started playing with this stuff. And I realized that actually some of the perception I had uh, just by the idea that, oh, this is designed for server, was actually wrong. The overhead and in terms of performances and so on is not there. If you call uh, something from a container, uh, you are actually calling it from a user mode process in Linux. The overhead of calling any kind of kernel API from a container is exactly the same you have from a regular process. So it's zero, the difference. You may have some overhead, like accessing the file system because you have those layers. It's not that bad reading. It can be bad if you write data. But the point is containers are transient by nature. So if you need to store persistent data, you can mount a folder from your file system inside the container. And at that point, you are accessing a file system from a Linux process. So again, zero overhead in comparison. So. All, the object, all those objections are actually true, but I also, as a sort of deja vu, I started working on operating system on devices like 20, a bit more than 20 years ago. And uh, at that time, I was working on Windows CE. Uh, someone else, like Marco, the guy who talked about Yocto yesterday, was working on Linux. He probably took the right decision. <laughs> but anyway, uh, Everyone's objection, why, why should I run an operating system on my device? I've been writing, writing firmware. 
it's so good. And this stuff is for PC, it's for servers. But if we look now. Yeah, so maybe you, you ask what's about Linux, why we don't simply use Linux? Um, because Linux has almost everything. Um, yeah, let's, let's look a little bit in the back. So it was also not really targeting embedded devices at the beginning. So it started out as a, a desktop system, basically, and then was really popular in the server area. Uh, but nowadays, you have billions of devices using Linux. If you think about your smartphone, for example, um, it has also a slight overhead with process isolation by default, but um, it's not a problem today because you have really powerful CPUs. Um, the hardware access is only doable via, uh, by kernel modules in kernel space. This can be a restriction, but it is also a security feature. So it's quite good to use Linux in this case because it, it forces you to think about interfaces and how can I abstract several things. Um, yeah, the multi-user, so uh, Linux is basically multi-users, user capable, but a lot of uh, embedded devices still use only root. So if you think about routers, um, a lot of routers still run all applications as root and then you don't profit from that. And, and then, yeah, you have a lot of tools and frameworks available for Linux, so that makes definitely sense to use Linux. Uh, you have Qt, or you have a lot of web servers, and so on. So even so, back then, I mean, if, if we think 10 years back, the people tell us, yeah, no, why do you want to use Linux? That makes no sense. We have this Cortex-M, uh, then it was probably three and we have one main loop and we don't want to use any OS because it's, it's only overhead. But anyway, nowadays everyone uses Linux. Yeah, unfortunately it was like 20 years ago. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> now I feel even older, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but the point is really, at that time the discussion was, oh, that, that's, there is a lot of overhead of, of complication, but today probably we real, realize that uh, we paid this price in terms of overhead and complexity, but we get back a lot more in terms of ecosystem, of security, of, uh, of uh, reliability of the solution we could build. So yeah, um, why do you use Linux today on a method devices? It's, it's as I said, you have a, a huge uh, ecosystem with a, a huge amount of libraries, you have a lot of debuggers, you have a lot of application that run out of the box. So at the end, you have a better time to market if you use uh, embedded Linux. There is also a, a huge improvement in security if you think about Cortex-M4, where you still have only one process, so basically one user, you have one operating system, each, up, uh, each subroutine or so can access basically the hardware as, as it wants. Of course, you can do their uh, security features as well, but normally you don't have an MMU. Um, and of course, uh, Linux is future-proof because it's now, as Walter corrected me, 20 years. But in embedded, I think it's, is it really 20 years? It's, yeah. It's, yeah. It's, yeah. It started around 2000 yeah, and something. So. Yeah. So yeah, it's future-proof. Yeah, so the point is, oh, so you are telling me that containers are going to replace uh, Linux applications? I don't think so. But on the other side, like 20 years ago, I was not saying you have to use an operating system on each and every device in the universe. I have some people here that uh, attended my C training probably more than 10 years ago, and I wasn't saying that. Uh, but the point is, uh, today uh, we have an additional option. It's really not going to replace Linux, uh, and let's say monolithic Linux approach for each and every device. But since this stuff is here, it's working, it's working well, probably it's worth considering it. So the points are, uh, yeah, first, first of all, as Stefan already said, Linux is here to stay. We can take it for granted. Embedded devices are going to run on Linux for, for uh, quite a long time. Um, but 
as Linux didn't, did not replace uh, firmware, probably containers are not fully replacing uh, traditional Linux development. Uh, but on the other side, uh, when I started working on operating system on devices, the driving uh, reason for people to adopt a, uh, an, an operating system were networking and user interface. If you just want to do uh, some control from some sensor, uh, uh, do some uh, toggle some output in response, a microcontroller is a perfect archi architecture. Uh, having your loop, checking the inputs, changing the outputs, it's a perfect solution. But if you start to uh, connect to a network or need to handle a complex user interface, then probably this reaches the limit of the capability of this approach. And then moving to oper an operating system makes sense. And today we are building more and more complex solutions. We have the internet into play for this, so our devices are not just standing there doing something. They are connected, they share information, they collect information, they process information, then it's then shared back to like backend system and so on. And since they are connected, they also start to have security issues and we need to ensure that we can update our devices and so on. So moving to a more, let's say, complex uh, architecture probably also give us advantages when our devices are inside uh, a bigger infrastructure. And so also my point is probably containerization is going to be here to stay. For sure on servers, I'm pretty sure also on devices. But if Linux, yeah, uh, if we think a little bit back, if Linux is so great, why do we need containers? I don't know who of you is basically developing some Yocto applications or something like that. Is there anyone? Okay. Um, one of the biggest problem I always have if I have to compile a, a Linux from with Yocto is to find a fitable um, environment. So often you, you are required to use a relatively old distribution. So, for example, uh, Ubuntu 16.04. Um, because a lot of so for, uh, newer versions have two, two uh, new GCC versions and so on, and then it won't compile correctly, and then you have to basically reinstall your system or you have to set up a VM, but that's super slow. One solution for that that I really like is to use a container basically a docker container then you can have any kind of um, distribution in it and you don't have to reinstall your system you don't have to use virtual machines you can simply start your container and that's exactly the first thing applications requiring different runtimes so inst instead of switching always the OS and reboot your system you can simply switch the runtime which is much more efficient and sorry another point about this it's also inside the same solution you may have different dependencies like last week I've been fixing an issue because uh, in our image our uh, it's built with Yocto, we use Docker Compose, and Docker Compose was using a Python library for downloading from URLs, and this Python library was using another Python library to do, I don't remember what, and then at some point, you know, Yocto is different layers. One of the layers was updated, and it was updating this Python library, but the Python library in between was requiring an older version of this library to operate, and so you need to fix it by I, in this case, it was easy. No one else was using that library, so I just downgraded it, and it works. But if you have multiple applications depending on the same libraries, and you have this kind of dependencies, like, oh, I know that my application is tested only up to this release, but I know that the other application works from this release, then fixing this kind of dependencies it gets quite complicated. Another thing where you can profit is you, can, you have a better isolation. So if you maybe use uh, the TempFS for uh, inter-process communication, what you shouldn't do, but a lot of people do still do that, um, you can really profit from containers because it gives you a better isolation between the different com components and applications. Um, it's also easier to port applications to because as yeah, that's also again because you have a better uh, Support for library you can use different versions and basically you only have to port your container 
which is exporting and importing if you stay at the same architecture, of course. So if you would switch, for example, from ARM to ARM64, you need a new container and you have to recompile your applications because it won't work with this kind of uh, architecture change. And you can use independent release cycles. So let's assume you have one container yeah, we are again with your web application and another con container with a Qt application and maybe they have different release cycles. They are even um, maintained by different teams. So one team releases each month a new version and the other only half a year, every half a year. So uh, that makes it really super simple because you only have to replace one container or even only one layer if it's the same base and you, um, you can go for it. So it makes it really easy to, to do that. So the point here, it's really, uh, if you really want to, to understand the model, probably you have to change your uh, perspective a little bit. The first thing is you should, probably this is already happening. Uh, you no longer look at your device as something uh, like a black box, uh, you start looking at your device as something that it's a part of a bigger system, a more complex system. You need to integrate to share data uh, and so on. And you can see the containers as a sort of building blocks for your solution. So uh, now I need to do a system that it's doing some kind of, let's say, PLC-like uh, uh, engine. I can implement this probably in C or C++. It's going to be quite reliable uh, and so on. Then I need to implement a very nice local UI. Probably I can use Qt uh, and I can have a different container with the local UI that is talking to the engine to collect the data it needs. And then maybe I need to share this data in the cloud or implement a web-based API or something like this. And there probably I have lots of tools like Python or Node.js that are really designed to implement this kind of solution. So I can use a different tool for a different purpose. And then I can integrate these building blocks on top of a base operating system. So you can consider Linux like the base operating system that allow you to run different building blocks that are your application. So another possibility is to uh, look out and check what do other companies do. Um, if you look at Microsoft, even they now switch to container solution with Azure IoT Edge um, or Red Hat with Fedora IoT. Then you have different, um, you have like ARM. Foundries.io is basically something where it's Torizon, which is our solution from Toratex based on um, the Linux micro platform that's uh, yeah from foundry side totio they provide commercial services as well for for that solution or one other thing that is basically almost maybe the one of the earliest uh, implementation for embedded containers that is Palena it was resin.io before so yeah Okay, so now let's, we talk about container, we talk about container on devices, now let's talk about container on devices using Qt. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, basically the, the main point are still, uh, still valid. So why should I run my Qt application inside the container? Uh, I can keep my application independent from the BSP. Uh, I can use different run times, different version of Qt. So uh, if I have a complex solution with different components developed by different development teams, uh, I don't need to force, oh, by the end of the year, everyone has to move to this release because we are going to do our huge annual release, and that's it. We can have different cycles, and when you are ready, you can move and you keep using the old libraries until you're not sure that it's not breaking anything. Uh, you can encapsulate all your dependencies, so also what you need underneath Qt in terms of stacks and so on. You can drag them with the application inside the container. And in the long term, this solution is easier to maintain. You don't need to cross-check dependencies and version between 25 different things. It's just together with your application. And even if you use Qt only for a single application, maybe the main user interface, that applies also for additional uh, components and runtime time you may need to use. Okay, <laughs> uh, so um, 
the first way we have to run uh, Qt inside the container is to use a generic Linux dis distribution. Uh, pretty much every uh, most popular distribution supports Qt. Uh, and for example, with Debian, it's pretty easy to, uh, to install Qt. It's just a matter of do apt get uh, Qt 5, whatever you want. And this stuff is going to be uh, installed uh, in your system. So, uh, and if you develop using this approach, then developing on a device, it's really the same model as developing on a PC. I install Qt. Um, the only difference is that, of course, I need the cross compiler. But the development environment is already quite well supporting this kind of, uh, of approach. And it's even easier with Qt for Python there. It's just a matter of installing the component and getting everything you need with PIP. And you are pretty much ready to run your software from inside the container. If you do the same thing with the Octo or something like this, you can do this. But then first, you need to integrate the libraries and the runtimes, build a new image and then you can start thinking about your application. So you have this phase in between that with this approach is pretty much close to zero. Um, one, one other approach uh, uh, beside using uh, Debian and then install Qt libraries is to use uh, boot to Qt. Um, who is familiar with boot to Qt? Is there anyone? <laughs> it's also Qt for device creation. It's the same. Anyone from Qt Marketing? <laughs> I mean, you okay. should do a better <laughs> job. <laughs> so it, it's basically the, a, a commercial variant of Qt, but you can also use it in an open source form. So it's a Yocto based distribution. Um, this is also an advantage. If you, for example, want to mix uh, a commercial application together with an uh, open source application, you could, of course, use uh, containers because then you can use in one container the open source versions of Qt and in the other container you can use the proprietary um, libraries of Qt. Um, one other advantage that Boot to Qt has, as I said, you can do that as well with the open source version. Um, it has a dedicated application model, so if you use EGLFS, then you don't have the overhead of any display server like X11 or Wayland. So, then, yeah, we already are a little bit more in the demo yeah, section. Now we start, we start with the demos. First, we explain the concept, but uh, pretty short. We are going to show some, some stuff running, I hope. Um, so here's the idea is to have a, a, a Wayland server running inside the container. Uh, Weston is a very popular implementation of Wayland Server, is the reference one, by the way. Uh, and then you can have multiple applications using different kind of runtimes running, of course, in separate containers. So you can have a Qt application running on Debian, and Qt supports Wayland, so you can have pretty much a direct connection there. Uh, you can use boot to Qt, and then you can use Wayland, but you can also use, for example, OpenGL to accelerate your rendering. And then you can have a legacy application that uses X, X um, like any legacy uh, old Linux application. And uh, Wayland provides also a compatibility layer with X. So basically, it's uh, exposing itself as an X server to the application. So you can also run these kind of applications. And you can basically share the same screen. So this is what we are going to demo. OK, first, first we start from the, uh, with the common prompt. Then we are going to show the screen. <laughs> so the first step, it, we need to run the uh, container uh, with Wayland. We have a pretty complicated command line, so it's easier to copy and paste, so we don't do any uh, typing mistake. But basically, what we are doing, we are starting uh, a, Wayland, uh, a, a container, uh, and then starting Western with some uh, parameters. OK, now it started. Uh, that's not very exciting. Basically, I have a black screen with just the mouse right now. So I'm not going to use the camera at the moment. But let's make things a bit more interesting. Now we are connecting on a second session. And we are starting a second container. This is basically Debian. It's a second instance of Debian uh, with the Qt libraries inside. And now we can start some sample applications.
This is one of the standard samples. We can also start the other one, so we can so see something on the screen. Okay, now I'm also taking the camera, so. I'm still working on growing a third end, so I will have to leave the microphone down. Let's see if I can show the screen at least. You can see we have quite a nice mess of cables and stuff. <laughs> but this is the screen, this is the calculator, and this is the clock. And you see I can interact with the windows. It's basically working from inside the container. So from the application point of view, we didn't have to do anything. It's just one of the standard Qt samples. It just work on top of Wayland, even if it's inside the container. Uh, we can try to start another application, a more complex one, like an application using OpenGL. Probably you already have seen this one. It's the Cube demo. Let's see if I can, okay. Oops, I turned the camera upside down. <laughs> I didn't start. Okay, here it is. And you can see it's also very, very slow. But this is because we are basically using software rendering for OpenGL. What we can do, now we can close this application. We can run another container, but we are going to run it slightly different in a slightly different mode. No, I already closed it so from the US. Um, as you can see, the comma line is pretty uh, similar to the previous one. The only difference is that we say it's going to run in privilege mode and it's going to access slash dev. This means that basically we are telling our container, okay, you can access hardware. We are sharing the full slash dev. Actually, what you can do, you can be a bit more granular, but just for the demo, it's probably the easiest thing to do. And now if we run the demo, this is going to benefit from the OpenGL acceleration. So you can see that, oops. You can see that now the animation is much more smoother. And also the CPU usage is close to zero because all the rendering is now uh, managed by the GPU. So of course, if you need to run this kind of application, you have to trade off a little bit on the isolation model. You have to grant more access to the container, but you can get the same performances of a local process. That's it. Yeah. And now we can also move to the other demos for the boot to Qt. Um, so the other thing that we want to show is if you want to use um, boot to Qt, um, as I told before. So what is how, how does boot to Qt look like? So you basically have some hardware, uh, CPU, GPU. Uh, then ha you have a hardware driver. That's all. Everything is uh, Linux based basically still. The hardware driver in this use case is Ednaviv, so we are running the stuff on IMX6 basically, uh, and it's based on Ednaviv. Ednaviv is the open source implementation of the Vivante GPU. Um, then you have the Qt platform plugin. In this case, it's the um, EGLFS KMS plugin. That's a little bit complicated then. <laughs> And on top of that, you have your normal Qt application. So even if you switch the platform plugin, you don't have to recompile your application. So I can run the same, if we have time, maybe not. Um, we can run basically the same application on an IMX7 without GPU by simply switching the plugin. And you can use the same container. You can use, uh, uh, almost everything stays the same. You only have to uh, change the configuration of boot to Qt. Yeah, that's basically here again what, what I explained. Um, it's the commercial version. Of course, you could also use the open source version. Let's see if I manage to have the camera straight this time. <laughs> um, so yeah, here you see the a simple application, um, basically in the Qt creator. We have an XML file and we have the uh, C++ file, and you can basically debug as it would be a normal um, boot to Qt or Qt for device creation uh, environment. So it, it takes a little bit of time because it's not the fastest setup that we have, but. 
now it's loading the different libraries, so it's starting the application. Exactly, so now we, we can switch to the camera so we can uh, show yep. it. Now it should run, basically. It's basically the demo we show also on our booth, or we yeah, show. Yeah, we are not going to win any award for <laughs> no. design, probably, but. But it's super <laughs> simple. It works. <laughs> <laughs> so if I press, for example, the, uh, okay. So if we press now a button, basically you see you are landing in the debugger, so you can debug your application as normal with C, uh, C++. And it's the same if we press the other button, then you should basically be able to debug the QML stuff or Qt Quick stuff. You see we hit the breakpoint also here. And what the application is doing is not super fancy, it's toggling on and off an LED. But it's really to show that also, again, from inside the container, you can easily uh, access also your underlying hardware. Exactly. And uh, yeah, one, one thing that is also nice, I can show you that here. So yeah, it is, this one is more for reference. If, if you want to do the same thing, um, try at home or in your company, as I said, it uses the mainline stuff. That This is necessary because um, the system, the platform that we were using, Torizon, is also using the mainline kernel. So you can't mix um, proprietary version of a GPU with the mainline kernel version. But it's really nice and it has basically a little bit more feature even today than the, the proprietary stuff. For example, uh, if you use Wayland, you can, or uh, now, if you use X11 or even EGLFS, you can use two screens, which is not possible with the proprietary driver. So it's, it's even better if you use the open source one. Yeah, basically, if you use the open source driver, you lose a little bit of performances because, of, of course, it's still to be optimized. But on the other side, you have the source code. You have a sort of grant that this stuff is going to be here to stay for the next 10 years. Exactly. What isn't solved, basically, or but what we try to solve maybe in the future, so if it's, it's kind of hardware abstraction. So what you can do, for example, with this LED that you unfortunately didn't see, but um, if you use an iMix 7 and an iMix 6 processor, the LEDs are basically not the same GPIOs at the end. What you can do, you can uh, modify the device tree and export the LED as a LED, or you can use named GPIOs. Um, what we do there is we use um, device tree overlay because that's also something which is quite nice. So device tree overlay basically allows you to append some kind of um, device tree entries to a compiled version of the device tree. So, so you can change the hardware configuration without having to rebuild the kernel and rebuild the, the, the full device tree. You just add some changes. Exactly. Um, and here you see how you run the, the boot to Qt container, basically. What is important, if you want, again, to use uh, the, the hardware acceleration, you have to use it in privileged mode. And you have to forward, of course, the ports. So uh, 22 is the SSH port, and the one and around 10,000 are basically the ports for GDB. You need to do this only if you want to run the debugger, actually. So yeah. you, you can remove this feature in production. But of course, it makes sense to, to be able to debug your code. Exactly. And then something to the platform configuration. So Qt allows you to, co to, to use this um, app controller config under ETC. Um, as I said, for the IMX6, that's the only thing you have to change basically between IMX6 and IMX7. So once you have to use HLFS on the IMX6 platform and then Linux FB on the IMX7 platform. So that's, I think that's really nice. So you only have theoretically to maintain exactly one version of your base image. Okay, so thanks a lot. We are already um, at the end now. So if you have questions, I think it's the right time to ask. <laughs> Anyway, uh, probably everyone has already seen we have a table at the entrance, so if you have any questions just want to talk about our products or this kind of solution, we are just here for this. Any question? Oh. From the only non-developer, I mean developers, 
please. <laughs> I'm joking. Uh, mm, hello. Which is uh, the minimum requirement uh, of RAM and uh, space for run this uh, container on? Uh, uh, currently, we officially support uh, our models that have eMMC. So we are talking about uh, two or four gigs of storage and uh, 512 megs of RAM. Uh, actually, it runs also on smaller system like uh, the IMX6 ULL. Uh, there we have, I think, 256 of RAM and uh, 512 of storage that is NAND flash. Uh, of course, if you want to move to a smaller platform, probably one thing you can do, for example, if you use Debian, Debian-based images are quite big. There is a slim version that basically removes, for example, manual pages on these kind of things. Uh, then you can shrink down probably for, to like 50 max for the base container. Uh, if you use something like Alpine, that is a relatively new distribution, it's developed in Switzerland by the way, uh, that it's really targeting containers. Uh, with Alpine, the base Alpine image is 5 megs. So of course then if you use Qt, we know Qt is really not exactly super slim, but you can, you can get in the range of uh, 20, 30 megabytes. And this is something you can definitely run also on a low-end model. And since we don't need any kind of virtualization, in terms of CPU, a Cortex-A, it's enough. So Cortex-A5, A7, it's OK. So no developers with some questions? Who is going to try Docker as soon as he's coming back home? OK. <laughs> Did you try Ubuntu Core, the Snap container system? Uh, yeah, we tried also this one. Uh, it's still slightly bigger than uh, the Debian Slim one, I think. But yeah, this is another solution. Uh, honestly, we are trying to use Debian because also many of the f information you find about the Raspberry Pi, for example, uh, probably 95% of, of this information applies also to a standard Debian image. Ubuntu has its own uh, peculiarities, so. Uh, we choose to, to run Debian, but nothing prevents you from using Ubuntu or even Fedora. Also, Fedora has a very small uh, version for containers. You can choose. And you can also mix. So if you find some kind of runtime that works better on Fedora, you can use Fedora for this one and use Debian or Ubuntu or whatever for, for, for the rest. Any other questions? Okay, so okay. thank you very thank much you. for your time. Thank you.